So these are going to be the five secrets to paint your models like the box art. I think the thing I always struggled with was like where to pull from real world reference and where not to. It's quite often a good idea to start with a base coat that is a 50-50 mix of your shadow colour and your highlight colour. As soon as you said that, I was like, that makes perfect sense. You'll see towards the bottom of, for example, an ultramarine, there's a much, much darker blue, like almost black. The best thing for painting true metallics and making them look good is... Some of the waffle that come out of this podcast last week while I wasn't here. Quality waffle. Like, the base rib thing. Can we... Can we chat about that? Yeah. Because yeah. there's, I imagine, I'm, seeing as George I'm has ready. Picked, I'm seeing ready. as George has picked the comments, I'm imagining there's not many base room comments um, because every I'm, comment. Oh, no, there are. Don't worry. <laughs> there are. It's fine. Every comment was absolutely cooking George for his ridiculous. It was a landslide defeat. Yeah. I was thinking, I, like, oh, a bit of a contentious topic. You know, maybe some people will think black base room, some people will think other. It was like 99%. No, George is wrong. Do you know what? You know what I, I was listening and I was driving while I was listening and I, I was angry that I wasn't here. <laughs> Basically, look, I've got to give it to you. Super humble to admit, humbling defeat, but you got smashed like a green. I'm not going to my opinion. I'm, dying, <laughs> got I'm happily dying like, on this hill. Smashed like a green. Yeah. That's, that's not my fault that everyone else is wrong. I don't know what to tell I, you. I will, I will say some of the comments I saw were actually worse than what you would say. <laughs> <laughs> so somehow people took it and made it worse. But yeah. a lot of people yeah. um, had the correct answer, which is obviously that black is the best base rim. I think you fundamentally misunderstood what a base rim is on a model. Yeah. And it's a frame. Yeah. It's not... Was the, the 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 cutting inside a cake or something you're <laughs> on about? What are you on about? It's a frame. Look at the frames on the, the, the paintings. paintings that we've got on the wall. They don't bleed into like they're not brown. The the surroundings of the of the artwork. It's right. a frame. But, but look, we've got to give it to you. You're humble in defeat. And, and, I, and I and I I take my I'm not that I'm wearing a hat, Joe. Uh, <laughs> I, I take my hat off to you because because because, because you took it like a champ. I'm gonna and say, I just want to say, Team Black Base Rim, we did it. Yeah. We did it. Yes. There we go. I'm going to give you an insight into my brain, right? Last night, I was painting like a little personal project mm -hmm. and I did my normal Steel Legion Drab Base Rim, right? And I literally went, you know what? I'm going to try it. Mm -hmm. And I painted a black base rim and I hated it. And I instantly <laughs> sanded it down and painted it painted into Steel Legion Drab again. The ones that got me was there was comments where like, someone was like, my favorite comments are the ones that are like 90% right. And then there's just something they, they throw in, in there. They throw yeah. in there, and I'm like, well, mm, I don't know. well, there was a few that was like um, explaining why George was wrong, which I was on board with. And then uh, they would <laughs> say, so like the best base room is black. And then they'd be like, or oh, just leave it unpainted. And I'm like, well, you were so close. You're so close. Had it. But yeah. so far, don't yeah. leave I will say, I would it. much rather a black base room than an unpainted base room. Like painted black rather yeah, yeah, than yeah. unpainted painted black. Yeah. Yeah. Unpainted yeah. Is, is not yeah. like Unpainted, it's just going to look weird. There's got to be a cheeky little mention for everybody. All the OG fans out there for the Goblin Green. That came in a close second. <laughs> yeah, but a Goblin Green, close, Goblin very close Green, second. again, we've done the nostalgia talk. We've done that and we've done the... A any green that, that represents Goblin Green still counts. I just want to clarify, right? My point was... I like the base rim to just match the basing. Yeah, so there yeah, is a time and a place for a black base rim. Like I will do a black base rim. It's not like if like the basing was all black, I was like, oh no, still Legion Drab. Like, yeah, I know that. I know that. But I think that is the thing that as soon as I got past that, like as soon as I stopped thinking, oh, it needs to blend in. Because like, it doesn't make sense that it blends it. Like what is it? So we actually had, I was talking to a client fairly recently who had, maybe you can put a picture up. It's the Helbrecht, um, conversion with yep. the neck one, one on yeah. the base and um it's got some sculpting on the base mm. so obviously the um it's got sculpted texture on the base so the base rim obviously has to it sort of waves up and down to match the the sculpting and um the 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 way that i was trying to explain it was that like putting black there so putting black on the base rim or putting black on those the bits where the texture is coming off of the base. Mm -hmm. It signifies that that thing continues beyond the base. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. 
it signifies the thing. If if you painted it the same color, it insinuates it that starts. it's actually there because yeah. you've painted something that color already, and that's what's actually there. So if you're painting the base room that color, it's like they're all standing on these little circle hills or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like when you see those cross sections in books of things, they kind of fade out the bit that would be solid material. Yeah, like, it's like, so, it's yeah, like, yeah. It, it, yeah. It, like um, yeah, it's to, it's to, it helps signify something that it Continues. carries on beyond yeah, the yeah. base and it's not actually part of the scene. And that is what the base room is. And there was another really good example of this. I'm not sure if we'll be able to put a picture up of this. I'll have to ask Eric, but there was a model that Eric did. I don't think he's entered it into anything or posted it anyway yet, but I know um, yeah. yeah. It's got a perfect example of that where it's like a log that's supposed to be like a, a tree branch mm -hmm. that's coming off of a tree, but the tree isn't on the model. So it's like, it looks like it's floating effectively, but because the corner where it would join the tree is painted completely black, it signifies that it continues beyond yeah. the base circumference. And that is just one of many reasons <laughs> why black base room is better because if you painted it to match it it sort of tells you that that thing is part of the the piece but if that makes sense in, in relation i am seriously considering next time i do bake a cake to put a layer of icing inside to see what it's like <laughs> so so if you take away anything from that I conversation don't know how we possibly could have extrapolated that from what i said I about the see, cake thing. i just see the cake thing just made me laugh because as soon as i heard it i was like no he's wrong <laughs> he's wrong <laughs> yeah yeah uh -huh. Have you seen the uh, the new Necron Overlord? Whoa, whoa! Hang on a second, hang on a sec. Before we before we go down this port, something quite special happened recently, George. And um, and <laughs> at the moment, I've been uh, I've been back to back teaching classes for the last couple of weeks. So I was up at I was up at Element uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, I, I know what this is. And, <laughs> and then and then this weekend, I've just taught a bad moon. The weekend just gone, and I've got another Manchester class coming up soon. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's always great to meet people that, that like sort of watch the podcast or that are uh, no siege or that like what we do, or whatever. But I was absolutely blown away by one of the students on the, uh, the Manchester class, because literally the first thing that they done when they came in complimented, uh, about a couple of things about the podcast and how we've helped them with their painting and stuff. But I was given something, George. Oh, I've got that. I was given something for you. And, uh, and we, and, and we wanted to, to reveal it to you today live on the uh, oh on the on the, on the show um, i will just i will caveat james has wrapped this up the the, the, right. the listener did hey, hey, i'm quite up. proud of my my rapping skills yeah. i'll tell you what james no one was no one goes without a christmas all right james okay was so, ecstatic at the thought of i don't think this is on camera probably but the thought of wrapping this up for you so this that, is wild. As the producer of the show, the fact that you've caught me off guard here is yeah, uh, yeah. wild and unsettling. Yeah. yeah. One thing, the other thing I will say is that I said to James, wait until we do the listener comments so uh -huh. that he can say, before we have a listener comment, we have a listener gift. Right. But he's jumped in way ahead of that. Too excited. Completely got that. He's way too <laughs> the, excited. The minions, the minions wrapping paper just had me, so I couldn't yeah. help it. In so, true James style. Yeah. So, All right. so yeah, so, so, uh, so you get to open that Whoa, now. Whoa, this is heavy. Yeah, you get to open that now live. And I'm just, just I'd be interested to know if you could guess what it is. Actually, it's, don't it guess what it is. actually weighs a ton. For yeah, the audio that, listeners, I've been passed a... Uh, a minions wrapped, a minions wrapped gift of sorts. So a that. bit, a bit of a backstory while you're tackling the uh, fantastic wrapping on that do parcel. Man, do I, do I? <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the students, <laughs> one of the students came up to me, and we'll put picture up because I, I took a photo, I took a photo with, uh, with, with him um, uh, on the class. He literally the first thing I've got to say two things. First things first, he was wearing a Blood Angels t-shirt, so that gives him extra kudos. And secondly, the he gave me that straight away and said, "You got to give this to George." Brilliant. So a massive thank you to, to for the gift. I'm sure George is going to spend the rest of the year this is get, tremendous. getting through those. This, the rest um, of the year, the yeah, rest of the week. The rest <laughs> of the week. <laughs> but that is uh, 48 tubes or packets, whatever you want to call them, of refreshers. Uh, so um, as an industrial yeah, amount. Yeah, the, the fact the fact that all of this stemmed from one passing comment is still absolutely mind blowing for me. But um, but uh, yeah. but yeah, enjoy. All right. I, I genuinely thought because for just so just to peel the curtain back a little bit for everyone that no doesn't. No, I just smuggled that in under my jumper into this room. <laughs> you did room. a very good job. I was thinking, where the hell did this into come this from? Into this room. I put my jumper down. You've just felt how heavy that is. I put my jumper down <laughs> so awkwardly. And I was like, he's going to literally say, 
why are you carrying your jumper like that? Yeah. But you didn't see it, so I'm quite... Well, thank you very much for the gift. That's, uh, that's yeah. very kind yeah, of We'll you. put a photo yeah. up of uh, when I was given the amazing present for you. Um, oh, but yeah, it's just... Uh, but he's a long-time listener of the, of the podcast. Um, he, he does. Uh, he goes out on fishing boats, like into the, 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 obviously the sea, and um, he listens to the podcast all the time. So... Uh, so yeah, just a nice. huge thank you. It's, it's, it's really, really kind. So of while I've to... lost all the support on the base rooms, the support for the refreshers is... It's gone through the stratosphere. It's, uh, it, yeah, it's bizarre. So it's like, one all in the grand scheme of the yeah, I guess, yeah. <laughs> What you've got to do is you see that as a consolation prize for being wrong about black base That's rooms. That's not a bad consolation so, prize so, because your prize for victory is absolutely nothing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I'm just trying to think of like sweets that I like that I can start an argument about on the podcast so and then hopefully free down the line, yeah. Maybe we can start like... Don't say too many because I'll be coming back with a car from classes for, for the sweets. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's try and think of like the heaviest things possible. I mean, they're pretty heavy. To make fair. as an in-joke so that when people then ultimately give those things to James to pass on to us, he has to carry them around. <laughs> yeah. Although the refresher is pretty heavy. Yeah. To be honest. That is, that is... 48 packs. I th- do you know what I thought? My only guess was when I was feeling through the packet, I was like, is this a bunch of batteries or something? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Yeah, very but, good. But yeah, what a wild there card. You go. There you go. Oh, great way to kick off the show. Thank you very much. That's okay. Okay. Well, uh, with that segue then, <laughs> yeah. I don't have a transition out of that. <laughs> it's totally caught cool. off guard. The, uh, the new Necron Overlord uh, released from GW. Yeah. Pull, uh, up, uh, pull up the old images now. I am feeling this. It's mega. It is cool. Yeah, so is this mega. like, I'm not too too into the lore stuff. Is this guy like animating? Is he like appearing? Is that what this effect is? In he, the, has a, he has a... Uh, what is the actual it's a, it's tra- term? I think it's called translocation I think is what it is translocation yeah. shroud is yeah. what that it's is really cool so it's similar thing to what you see on the what was the big Satan model uh, it, of kind of like that so in the new Warhammer Plus uh, Salamander kind of like short short sort of CGI story there's a there's a um, death mark that sort of like teleports around in that I don't want to spoil it for anyone obviously but um the effect of like the movement of him teleporting from one area is very similar to that, the way yeah. it works. And um, it's just a really cool model. Like I, I, I literally want to paint one. I, I, yeah, I think it is, it is really cool. And it, it kind of, um, it's funny noting on, we mentioned, what was the, um, the Necron character that got revealed recently? The other one. Oh, the well, name um, one. Imitech. Is it uh, Imitech. Imitech. Yeah. Yeah. So we were kind of, uh, well, I'm brought up how that was a bit more reserved than some of the other mm-hmm. Necron characters. And you might suspect that Imatech would have been like a big beefy one, but they've had quite a few big beefy ones over the mm. few years. Um, this is kind of back to being like another really interesting kind of unique one. I think there's not many models that look like that. Is I'm that? trying to work out like the scale of it from looking at it. I think it's on a 40. I it is a, just an overlord. It is, yeah. So yeah. it's not too big then. You yeah. can you can compare it to obviously the overlord that was in Indomitus, I suppose. Potentially, yeah. I, I mean, I think it's obviously going to be a lot taller just because of like, if you look at it, if that is a 40 mil, which well, he's, I... He's basically on a little tactical rock. So it's still only, it's still the same thing. Um, obviously, he's separating a little bit in the middle. So he could be... I think that's a brilliant taller. design. Like, I, I like... I've got to say this, like you see, there are models which like are really like cool looking. And then there are models which are just um, like amazing as in for design features. And like the thought process that's gone into it to have him kind of like separating and, and sort of like appearing or disappearing or whichever way he's going, I think it's great. So the design team have done a great job on that. Like it looks, it's really cool the, the effect of the swirl as well. And it's all in that sort of Necron block kind of like patterning as well, which is really awesome. Um, Quite yeah. interesting as well. I thought that they, um, they showed on the article that it was originally teased on the in a rumor engine. engine two years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you can tell the rumor engine image, which has been made black and white, is painted as well. Yeah. So it was still it was like fully there two yeah, years yeah. ago. But they've obviously waited for the codex things to to kick in and stuff. I think my favorite bit's the scepter because the scepter is actually appearing as well. It's like shifting into the thing as well, which is really cool. So not even the weapons one piece as well. It's just, oh yeah, I didn't even notice. It's really that. cool. Like the thought process behind it is is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's like cut off in the middle. Here. It's yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like there's shifting. a if you scroll down, there's another image where like a bit of a side on view. There you go. He's he's in half as well. Yeah, yeah. His legs like not actually there, which isn't entirely apparent from the front until yeah, you sort exactly. Of yeah, angle it yeah. around, which is which is great. Well, it's not apparent from the front because he's been shrouded by his translocation shroud. <laughs> Thank you for for that. <laughs> Same from the back as well. Yeah, yeah. Can't really see it. So it's cool. It's hard to sell effects like that convincingly in 3D form if you get what I mean 
I think it's. A I think they've done a good job. It's it, the, the paint job as well with the blending on the swirls to insinuate the transition and the, the way it's moving also helps. Obviously, because the thing is, I, I'd argue that's a part of the model that you kind of have to do some kind of tonal variance on to mm. show the movement. If it's a solid, if it's a solid color and you just paint it one color, then it just looks like it's part of the model that the effect helps helps with the actual what he's doing I think. yeah it perfectly yeah. sort of signifies this sort of like digital kind of thing as well yeah, yeah, the yeah. design cues of being like yeah pixels. what is that the big sort of metallic satan thing that i'm thinking of the uh big, the, the shard of the dragon isn't it oh it's a, uh it's the it's something along those lines but they they when you look at that image that's got a similar kind of digital disappearing yeah, yeah. um thing um yeah so it's, it's a hard uh effect to sell on a model design i think i know people do like clear plastic and yeah. clear, clear models and stuff sometimes to sell it and i don't think that really works no so it's that's great. a good way to do it yeah yeah painted much this week anyone mm, joe know. what's happening with this model much. you painted for the as soon, to be honest as soon as i um he's trying to get you back as soon as stick. i missed the deadline i was like oh, i don't have to do it you've read it off <laughs> yeah um no well i've been away i was obviously away last week um and yeah, once once a deadline was missed, I was kind of like, oh, I'll just get to it when I can. So sorry about that. It will be, it'll happen at some point. We'll do the next Space Marine thing we do. We'll, we'll put it on that. We'll have to do like Ultramarines again in 2027 and then well, come full ep circle. Well, episode did pretty well. So if we have to do it again, <laughs> then we have to do it again. Yeah. yeah. James, been uh, painting the courses, I suppose? Yeah, just been teaching. Some of the classes have been really good. Like um, the one Bad, well, both have been great. Like the Edmund one was really good. Um, but the the Bad Moon one as well, like, I always love teaching at Bad Moon. It's uh, really good. If you're ever in London, um, and this is just, they're not paying us to do this, is just me saying like, Bad Moon's a phenomenal, phenomenal venue. Um, good pizza. Good pizza. Pizza's amazing. Yeah. Go for, so the, pe like go a, for the pizza, stay in game. Um, was it like a gaming hall food? So it's like, it's a, it's, a, it's a really well presented kind of like, really like, high-end looking shop as in all the product is on one wall loads of really clean gaming tables like really nice cafe area at the front uh, hence the name um like it's just yeah it's just really good like willem he, he owns it one of the owners he's, he's really top top guy as well um yeah i just always enjoy teaching there it's always nice to you always get a really good crowd really good vibe um and yeah the pizza's amazing so yeah if you want to join any of our courses, you can, of course, go to uh, seedstudios.co.uk forward slash shop. Uh, we've got tickets on sale on there for 2024, I believe. Yeah, yeah we'll just announced dates. all the 24 dates. 24 yeah. dates, yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got, like, we got, like, a new army painting class. Uh, we've got some sculpting classes. And then both the EMCs are on there as well, the one and two. So, so yeah. that's the Essentials Masterclass. Essentials Masterclass 1 and the Essentials Masterclass 2. So, yeah. Cool. Viewers' comments? Yeah, let's mm -hmm. do it. I think he's going to be a bit grueling for you. So I'm just going to pre... Uh, well, no, because he's picked them. Oh, actually, I'm yeah, telling you now, there is going to be none about yeah. base rooms. Well, I figured that if we just sit here and talk about base rooms, we're going to be here until the end of time. So uh, related to the Necrons, though, actually, uh, Niall Richard Curran says, uh, have you used that fluoro green on uh, Necrons? Super curious. I haven't found a Gloria recipe I 100% like. Uh, I have used the fluoro greens, the Vallejo ones that we mentioned on the last episode. Mm -hmm. uh, I have used those on Necrons. I haven't used the green... Uh, but I used the orange one, which looked great. It just happened to work with the scheme I was doing. Uh, but those are really, really good for, for models like that. I actually have the, um, obviously I listened to that last episode, and I have the box set, the little box. I think they're what you're talking about, mm -hmm. um, of all of those colors. I can't remember. I think it got bought for me because it doesn't seem like something that I would have gone out and bought. I didn't even know they'd done a set. I just thought um, it was like individuals. I'm if it's the same thing, I'm, I'm, what you're talking about is the same. Because I listened last week, so gotcha. I haven't actually seen what you're, what you were holding up but um yeah i had like a, a it was like a box set of like six i think different um like six different ones or something i, think, I don't know all in a box. i don't know if you can get a fluoro so i'm not too sure I, i'm i haven't seen it this, this is what i was talking about oh, okay it's not those maybe i'm thinking maybe it's like a scale potentially box. i thought you i thought the fluoro scale 75 like flu fluoro try searching that see if that comes up quick i uh, think like, they do have i think they do have it's like again, scale 75 uh, like it's like a proper fluoro I think they do have a fluoro yeah, yeah, it's this, yeah, it's this yeah, box yeah, yeah. yeah they do so yeah. it's very similar to what you were saying basically yeah. I'm sure really they're similar. basically the same thing it's just yeah. sort of the the concept more more so than a yeah, yeah, yeah. product but yeah because yeah. I always thought those Vallejo ones the model colours you can buy them individually I, I didn't realise but yeah yeah, yeah but uh, Necrons anything like that with like loads of glowy stuff on it it's perfect especially with a Necron because it's not like a massive focal point of the model it's just like it's like glowy accents I probably wouldn't use them on blades 
no. for like glowing eyes or like yeah. the like, orbs and I think, whatnot. I think they're more suited personally to like more fantasy stuff, like magic and etheric kind of things. Like yeah. you can do it on librarians and stuff like that, maybe, or like the hand, like for the. Mm -hmm. for the so almost any, anything that's magical. Not supposed to be solid. Does yeah, that make sense? Exactly. Like, yeah, like, an, exactly like an orb or a flame or Or like whatever. a glow. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Mike Burt 5512 says, uh, this is in regards to this ongoing thing that we've had where we're trying to come up with different month names. This, this is brilliant. This is better than any of the ones that already exist. This so was brilliant. We've been spitballing the ideas of like, you've got March McCrag, you've got October, and we were trying to come up with some other ones. Yeah. And this is like so obvious and yet yeah. so genius. Uh, he says, I can't believe no one has said Tau September. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Perfect. Like, and I think I would say you don't have to paint Tau Sept. Like the actual Sept. Sept. Just any of them. You can paint any Tau yeah. in that. But I think, that's, I think that's the first official one that we're now adding on. I think that's a challenge we've got that we do. On. We've, we've got to fill the do, I think we do Tau Sept Ember. Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we've got to do it. Um, and when you say it, you have to pause really awkwardly like that. Yeah. yeah. Can, can, you also, can you also do... Really, you have to say that, otherwise it that's, doesn't that's work. That's the way to do it, I think yeah. you should really also really unnecessarily hit the apostrophe. So it's to ow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's to ow sept Sept ember. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, I think, the first... We, so we want to fill the rest of them. So yeah. if anyone's got any suggestions or if we want to come up with some, I think that's the first official... We just missed it, unfortunately. But, um, <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't. Someone get... wants to come up with one for. Uh, so we had Dark Angels December. Yeah, I was going to say I'm yeah. surprised you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't go. No, on that, that one. was really good actually because of the reasons given as well. What? Because the, the lion is Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, the lions. But the lion was. Yeah. Oh yeah, the lion was Jesus. Died and came back to life. Yeah. 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 Um, I think. I think that. I was going to say no. The lion's Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, you're right. Yeah. Um, so I think that I was think, one of the think, points they made. They said, like, it's got a, a guy with long hair and a beard. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, I think I think Dark Angels December's official it's now. Pretty as good, well, yeah. Then. I think that's a good one. Yeah. Um, which need, which need, uh, need to fill the rest. Yeah. Need to fill the rest. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't uh, think any of the ones that we came up with were good enough to stick around. I can't even I don't think we've heard any good ones. You, <laughs> <laughs> I, you, I, said, you said Drukari December. We've already. No, that didn't work. You can't, didn't you work. can't do Drukari in December. They're not, they're not nice enough. Like, you could do um, December's a nice time of year come on what if you did uh, you did February and you did you like, have to paint, Emperor, Emperor's Children you have to paint Fabulous Bill you have to paint either Fabulous Bill or just Emperor's Children in yeah. general Fab, I was going to say I, I was going to I was going to say Angels April we're pushing it but we've got no other substitutes so I have to take what I can get if, uh, if someone wants to we've already gotten rid of George's Drukari one. So if someone wants to trump that for February, then we will we will do it. I, I was going to say Angels April. You have to paint any chapter that has the word Angels in the name. That's, yeah, that's, that's not a, a pun though. One. Like you're you're the man yeah, of Jamesisms, yeah. and you've you've just not had a pun. Yeah. It's alliteration. The pun, like, I think, oh, I've, been pretty, I've been pretty consistent for most weeks. All right, I'm gonna yeah, have a bit of time the, off. Here's the thing with it: the pun will always be the best one. Mm -hmm. The pun will always trump anything else we come up with. However, some months, such as Dark Angels December, you are going to have to just succumb to the fact that there isn't a correct pun. That's true. There. But yeah. the, the pun will always, if there's one that's a pun, it will always come first because yeah. it's better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that's that's a general rule. So if anyone's got any they want to suggest, get me in the we can all We can all throw out, you know, um, oh, well, ideas. I've got one. <laughs> Angels April, whatever. <laughs> March from McCrags actually March a really good one. It is really good. good. That yeah, is a is really good. good one. Personally sponsored by Nick Baton. Yeah, one. he loves that it. That is actually Absolutely a really good it. one. October's cool. It's a cool little pun. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think we need to have a thing. We'll have to do that. We'll have to do like an official calendar. Yeah, and we can we can start it in um, twenty twenty four. We can start it in January. Maybe we could do a little update every every month. Can you imagine that having like a proper printout that you have in like your hobby room? Yeah, yeah. Just all these ridiculous names yeah. that we've come up with. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Uh, Jonathan Palermo, who's 6166, says, uh, talking about varnishes, uh, this is in regards to the whole airbrush versus rattle can situation. Uh, talking about varnishes, the day I swore off can varnish and only varnishing with airbrushes was the day I was varnishing my full Death Watch army. I decided to paint the army in a style where I didn't just highlight the edges of the black armor, but larger highlights over the full panels of the Space Marine armor. Uh, anyway, I waited until I finished the entire army before I varnished. Big mistake. The entire army was ruined. Going to have to strip the whole lot. Oh, oh no. That's bad. That's a rough one, isn't it? That is savage. Varnish, like... 
Varnish does make me nervous, you know. It's worth it because it looks, everything looks better after it. Hmm. But it does, it is one of the things where I'm like, what do I do? If, if it, if do you do rattle wrong. can varnish or do you do? No, no, I do. I, I, since I got the airbrush, I'm, I, I airbrush varnish. I haven't really ever had any issues, to be honest. I don't know I've had a problem with airbrush varnish. Really. No, I, mean, no I haven't. There wasn't like self-induced, like by either clogging up the airbrush because I didn't thin it when I was first doing it or by like over-spraying. But that's not really a fault of the product. That's yeah, user error. I'll be, right? I'll be honest. I never really had an issue with rattle can varnish either. That's probably like, I didn't, you I didn't, probably shook it enough. Like, yeah, yeah, I, I think yeah. I didn't, again, I probably didn't use it loads. I think there was quite a small window between me actually bothering to varnish with a rattle can and then eventually getting an airbrush anyway. There's a lot of variables um, at play with just using rattle cans in general as well, like yeah. we discussed before. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, just in regards to temperature, how well you shook the can, the list goes on. I think, yeah, it's definitely one of those things that like, unfortunately, even you can you can prep as much as you want and do everything right, but something can go wrong with varnish. Yeah. Okay, just just, just have a test, test, a test object. Do the test. I would definitely say yeah. like, if you're going to use a rattle can varnish and you've just painted an army like this, like learn from this mistake, varnish one model, like first. Mm -hmm. Check I didn't, you're happy I'd with even it. just say just have a test, a bit of plastic card or something painted in. Yeah, but even then, I wouldn't yeah. be like, oh, I'm going to test it on a bit of plastic card. Okay, time for the full army. Like, no, no, I get you know. it. But there's got to be that point of commitment though, where you go of right, course, okay, yeah. like you know. So. That's very true. That's kind of the upside of like doing the airbrush. You're kind of doing like one model or a squad at a time you yeah. can't really like That's, just because of the airbrush like you just can't hit that many models at once right yeah it's yeah. also just going to come with experience you'll suddenly be like yeah i trust this more now uh speaking about paints that we mentioned last week uh sash says uh tamia and mr hobby paints are acrylic but they are not water-based they're solvent based that's why they require different thinners and removers and why they need to be mixed with similar solvent based paints and not white water-based paints such as Citadel, Vallejo, Army Painter, etc. Yeah, the more I, you know. I was incorrect saying an amber. I always get those confused. Yeah, but um, yeah, you just have to use a specific. I use Tamiya uh, XV, whatever it is, with the um, with the Mister. The Hopper. Tamiya thinner. Yeah, yeah, the Tamiya thinner for for the. Tamiya. I love the Tamiya stuff through the airbrush. Oh, it's so honest. good. It's really nice. Flat white is great. Hmm. I'm not dabbled with any of those. Yeah. It's very good. That's like a, a so whole, smooth. Like that's a whole category of product that I'm like afraid to dip into because it's all new, right? Because it comes in glass bottles, and you're like, no, that's different. Can't I've got to like, buy bottle. new thinners. I've got a whole new process for cleaning my brushes. Yeah. Got, everything is like starting fresh. But I mean, there's a reason that all the like scale model painters and whatnot. Like, it's definitely worth it. Very right? good. Yeah. They're, very, they're de definitely worth it. Like really, really good. Yeah, maybe that's something I have to dab with. I have the same sort of um, apprehension with. Um, oils as well i'm the same with that because it just seems like the thing with oils i've always maybe i haven't seen enough of what they can do and what people do with them and stuff like that and some of the stuff does look really good but i'm always like whatever you're getting out of it i feel like i'm just more comfortable achieving that with normal paints. my issue with them is whenever i see one of those tutorials and this probably comes from a lack of understanding whenever i see one of those tutorials it's like right paint your model now wipe off all the paint you just put on the bottom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah. like, surely the amount of time spent removing and cleaning up, and then inevitably there's always some sort of issue or yeah. like clean up after your clean up because your clean up wasn't good enough. Mm. And I feel like in that amount of time, I could have just recess shaded the whole model. Yeah, I, I, I see it as very much like if you're trying to walk out the front door of the house, you go through the back garden, over the back fence, round the block <laughs> into the front. Like, you know, like the amount of time you're going to spend, the amount of time you're going to spend with cotton buds or Q-tips or cotton, whatever it is you're taking that stuff off with a brush or whatever. Like just and then like thinning it down, getting know, thinners just, just, out, just, and then like suffocating to death in your painting room because you've been inhaling methylated yeah. spirits for the last 45 minutes. Literally, if you want shadow or to pin shades. Well, now you're selling it to me. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you want James shadow. James with his undiluted uh, cleaner, he's thinner, probably yeah. not yeah. going yeah. to feel a thing. Yeah. yeah. If you want to put shadow or some uh, or, or, or like tone an area or tone a recess, just put the paint in the shadow and control it. Like You don't need to cover it in stuff and then spend an hour taking it all off and then you get a bleed somewhere or whatever. Like, there must, just, but there must honestly, be like, like something else. Something to it. Yeah. I mean, For me, wants... it's more It's more like, well, I haven't perfected the other thing yet, so I'm just going to keep trying that. Sure. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to keep yeah. working on that. Yeah. I, mean, the, I always see it in the speed painting context as well, which is why I kind of don't like the idea of it because of all the cleanup and stuff, like I said. But I don't see a lot of high-end display painters using them 
maybe that's just my ignorance showing through. Except in the context of like free-handed, like flat services, where you need like maybe more of a working time. I think if you like, could be, like you, are you, I've been to like uh, SMC, like in, in in Belgium, I think it is. I can't remember now, but I've been to SMC before. You see a lot of like um, uh, scale model stuff, and it's all a lot of it is oils and stuff. It has a hundred percent as a place, and it has a way of doing it. But I just think like I, my my comments is that more just because it's in the European scene, it's more popular. No, it's just the type that? of competition that right, it okay. is, and like SMC, like their painting competition. It's very it's very different to like Golden Demon or like other painting competitions. But like um, I think that. It, it's, it's it's a great way of painting using them. My comments and, and personal opinion on it is purely down to the fact like if you're trying to do a process orientated and paint an army quickly, for example, whatever, that's that's the reason why I think just put the shadow where it needs to go rather than you using oils and then wiping it all off and like that. You, having said that, you can gloss it and then still pin shade with oils. That's fine. It's that, but that it's isn't that the same as just putting a That's what I mean, yeah. You know, like it's you yeah. know feel but, free to uh Comment in it below. Roast us in the comments. Yeah, okay. and, and Maybe I'll have to give it a go, to be honest, just out of like pure curiosity. Well, yeah, yeah, Just yeah, like I can put it to bed. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, I've still got says, I'm surprised that James is very keen on the jump pack intercessors. Uh, this is in regards to the Christmas boxes that we speak about last week. Uh, being an old guard like myself, I would expect that he too would hate the new jump pack and ankle thruster models. Personally, I think the old school jump packs on regular assault intercessors look a million times better but still way worse than the previous box of Vanguard veterans. What say you, James? That's a very, very good question. Uh, no, I do I do like, so I'm, all cars, I love the old jump pack like style. I think it's great. Um, I used to love the fact that you could have the the harness straps across the front of the chest as well. I think that detail is quite cool. Whereas the new ones look like they're mag locked on, which is quite cool as well. I, I'm actually, I'm going to throw a wild card in there. I actually like the single thruster variant that the Sangard have actually, because... Like your assault troops, you know, if 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 a single thruster one that the sand guard is that like where the jetpack's in the middle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Like if that can lift a marine in full all night, uh, all night armor off the ground, then you solid gold. You don't need <laughs> you don't need you don't need the giant double double thruster one. And the thing is, especially when you're in combat, like you know, if you're an assault troop, you don't want this bulky gear. Very on wide, you. aren't they? Yeah, yeah. You don't want this. That, I like the sleek. Yeah, that's why I, I just prefer. Yeah, I, and, I, and I'm going to throw an even worse wild card out there. I don't put the wings on the on the sand guard. Like, imagine being in combat with your mates. Yeah. Combat with your mates, yeah. as we all are at some <laughs> well, point well, in the day. Yeah. You're, you're in combat with your mates. You're, 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 you're you know swings. when you're there, Joe, and you're just chilling out yeah, with you your mates? you're in combat. I've never, never yeah, you're swinging. Even yeah. been in like a fight or something. I've never been like, yeah, I was in combat the other day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're swinging your blade X-Gar main round, and oh, I, bu I bumped into Gary's wing. You know, like yeah. it's just like, oh, so I just took the wings off. It's literally tight, tight fitting, like uh, uh, so single wait, thruster the, jump the pack. The Sangard, I'm like feeling like I'm having like a Sangard have got these decorative wings on the side yeah, of the jump packs. Do they have the the single thruster in the middle of the wings then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's oh, a single okay. pack, yeah. Like it's the best it's it's my favourite style jump. I think I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's the Mark IV Maximus uh pattern jump pack. Um because in 30k they've got the, yeah, uh, the all the assault mark it. for all yeah, the mark yeah. four assault marines have got the those packs as standard. I think I was thinking of like a sanguinor, which also has He's got I, he's got that's what he's got. Yeah, but then the wings yeah. are like way Bigger, bigger, yeah, yeah. So I was yeah. like, well, I was then I was trying to remember, like, oh, do all the Sanguinary Guard have like those massive wings? But yeah, they don't. Yeah, they're like. So I don't, I don't have those on my Sanguard. I like them looking sleek, like with a single pack. You know, no bumping into Gary while you're swinging your blade around. Yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's. Yeah, I like all the pack designs. And going on the new ones, I think the new ones are really good. The ankle thrusters is quite cool, actually. I, I like the ankle. I, thrusters. I actually do like them. I think they're quite cool. I think. I didn't even notice them at first, actually. So yes. I, I didn't notice them on the. I noticed them when I'd done the captain. Yeah, because he's got them, but I don't. I don't. I think that the the normal assault marines have got them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. Have. yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. No, I think not the assault marines without a jump pack. They don't have them. The assault marines at the assault. Sorry, assault, the assault intercessors, intercessors don't, have them. don't have them. Yeah, yeah, no, no. But the, the the assault intercessors with jump packs do. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, still getting used to that name. Still getting used. To, they're <laughs> still jump assault marines. It's they're just, still assault it's marines. Jump pack intercessors. Um, yeah, I think the where that commenter went wrong was assuming that James wouldn't just absolutely love anything space marine or blood angel related, regardless of whether he prefers the old one. I still, I, I like both. Does that go back to your? They were almost completely right until the last minute. The yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's like ninety percent right. Ninety percent, yeah. But then you realise you're talking to James, who's the biggest space for a blood angel fan you could be. Yeah. I don't think much is going to turn him against it. To be yeah, honest. yeah. Just, just pure just, excitement. Just to prove how much of a fan he was, right? He got he got all fussy earlier when we were setting up the set. We've got the white dwarfs behind us. 
And James threw a bit of a hissy because he didn't have the Blood Angels one behind him. There was shirt. no hissy. I, I, the one behind you is my very first white. But you wearing a Blood Angel shirt? Um, I might be. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, we're getting close. And I, I want to actually touch on something. Wait, wait, wait. Actually, how Someone, many of those t-shirts do you own? Uh, is sports. it like SpongeBob where he goes in like the the wardrobe in the morning? He's just got like a whole row of Blood Angel shirts. I have a few in different colors. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but even in the same colors, I got two in red. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. That's but, what I mean. Like that's a, like. It's actually brilliant because it's like, I think a lot of people would, as this comment may be insinuated, like, oh, you know, as a, as a big Blood Angel fan, as a fan of the old school stuff, I would expect you to not like this. But James is just so excited about all of that. And, and I'm going to, we haven't mentioned the comment. He's like, you had me at Space Marines. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it. I can't remember for love nor money the, na the name of the person. So I'm really sorry for not remembering your account name, but we will get it on the screen or we'll go back and have a look. But someone mentioned, obviously, touching back on the earlier part of the conversation, a time a time of year. December is actually the Sanguinala, which is the which is the festival season in the Warhammer 40,000 universe. Uh, which when is I the, read that comment, I the, thought they was making that up. No, the well, that's a real thing. Sanguinala is a really a real 40K law time of year, which is a celebration. And it's the, it's a celebration. It's basically Christmas. It's basically, yeah. It's basically, it's a celebration of Sanguinius' sacrifice, basically. So, so that's- Oh, it's Easter. <laughs> So it's, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so it's Blood Angels Christmas. It's not like Warhammer Christmas. Well, we've got a new run in for uh, for April then. So <laughs> yeah, could that be April? Or would that I don't be know. December? I don't know. I, I don't actually know from the book. From the book. Well, it's going to be Easter. Well, it's got to be in April. Well, potentially, yeah. Angels. Suppose, yeah. Angels. Yeah. April. You said Christmas. Why is it Christmas? Well, no. What I'm saying is that the comments <laughs> are sacrifice the, the comments are mentioned that oh, it's, maybe coming, it's, up, it's coming up to Sanguinala. So with that in mind, you'll be seeing a bit maybe, more. A bit more maybe bit maybe maybe Sanguinala could be. Could be Easter then. Could be April. Potentially, yeah. I don't know. Let us know in the comments. When do you think it is? Do you think it's do you that's think better it's than it being April or Angels, Angels April or something? Yeah, yeah. I bet he's. Uh, I bet he's collected over the years all of those like Warhammer Christmas ornaments. I bet your tree is just absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I actually he's got Sanguinius at the top. I have no. I have no Warhammer Christmas decorations at all whatsoever. But that's a good idea though. Like, <laughs> but no. And, and I just want to say, I just, I just fundamentally don't believe. He just that. hangs <laughs> pots of blood, blood red, red off yeah. his tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, used ones. Yeah, yeah. No, but you're saying about the white wolf. So that white dwarf behind you, funny just enough, it's a sanguinor at the top of the tree. Like yeah. a, a hey, look, it look, it look good at the top of a tree. It's got the wings and everything. It's a bit small, but uh, mm. yeah, maybe. Uh, the, so the white dwarf behind you is my very first ever white dwarf that I got. So that is the very first one. And then yeah, like, I just was like, oh look, Fur Furioso. So I just stick that one there. Mm. Yeah. Just a quick one. We wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world class team here at Siege Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget. Whether you want a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army, we offer well above the industry standard of quality and experience. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at cstudios.co.uk. And just for you podcast listeners, you can get 5% off of your first commission with us by using code PAINT5. Now back to the show. So topic for this week, uh, as a studio who paint in the, the box art, heavy metal style, and me and James have a particular affinity and personal Love. unhealthy obsession with trying to replicate the, uh, the box art painting style, we get asked a lot about how, how you do emulate that and how we paint in the way that we paint. And I thought it'd be interesting to sort of break down some of the techniques and the nuanced specifics of what a box art painting style is. And if you're someone who's already like doing the basics, like your edge highlights and your TMMs, and you're doing things in that style already, but you're realizing it doesn't quite look like the box art, I want to go into more than just like color choice and speak about the sort of the specific yeah, yeah. five points of what you can do to make it look more like the one on the box. Uh, so the first one I've listed here, we mean James curated a little bit of a list earlier today. Uh, the first one that we thought of is you'll often see uh, in the style that we paint is it's quite often a good idea to start with a base coat that is a 50-50 mix of your shadow color and your highlight color. And that gives you this sort of smoother transition when you do start glazing in your shadows and your highlights. This gives you sort of this natural blended smoothness kind of works really well it, it helps with refinement quite a bit because then the the jumps between the colors are closer together which means those incremental little changes that you make don't make such a drastic impact on the surface of the model so like if you are pulling shadow to the bottom of a shoulder pad and let's just say you've uh you've mixed a bit of a darker red in when you do that glaze of the darker red to create the shadow it just helps helps work better with that i find as well that when you're doing the the glazing stage it's much much easier 
to avoid that staining that you sometimes get. You know, sometimes like you'll thin down a glaze mm. and you'll like really thin it down. You'll be like, I'm going to do this like, you know, 20 passes, whatever. And you put that first one on, just instantly there's this like mark, mark of yeah. like where it's clearly been wet. Yeah. As soon as you, you kind of touched on that on an episode previously, and I never really thought about it like that. And as soon as you said that, I was like, that makes perfect sense. And I think I might, I, I I would definitely look to try and implement that in my own painting now just to save those. Like, like I think in the context of the previous conversation was we were talking about the, um, potentially the Sons of Horus yeah, yeah. thing, which is um, the, the recipe, which um, you, uh, I quote you at saying it's a bit of a nightmare, I think. It is paint. a nightmare. Yeah. Um, so, and that's got a lot of mixes in it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we were talking about. And, on the face of it, without knowing why those things are being done, it can look like an unnecessary. What are you doing a rat for? Yeah, like, it's like James said about like going out the back door and over the fence and whatever. Just to get yeah, to yeah. Home. It's like oh, you're just being like yeah, like you know, well, difficult for the sake of it or to like show off or something. But even in the explanation that you just said, which is like if you uh, mix in your shadow color and your highlight color and coming up with a a base tone for that, obviously that then limits you a little bit to what your base tone ends up looking like. Um, because ordinarily I think people are used to, I like this color in this part. That's what my base color is going to be. And then I've got this and then I've got this. But I think people uh, hear base color and they don't think of it as foundation. They think of it as this is what it's going to look like it's when be. it's finished. Yeah. 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 Um, but then I think potentially the reason you end up with those insane mixes that we're talking about where it's like three parts one thing one part another thing one part another thing is getting that flexibility back to choose the exact color that was that the castellans want. of the rift model that i spoke about in the ultra yeah, yeah. Mix. that was a three color mix and it was in it wasn't one to one to one it was like three to three to two or something like yeah. that. yeah and i think as soon as i understood that and and then going off that point you were just saying is that like that is what gets that flexibility back and actually gives you more flexibility mm -hmm. than if you were just picking a color off the shelf that you like. Because as much as like that ultramarine model was, you look at the recipe and you're like, this is ridiculous. Like, what is the point? But when you start doing that glazing stage, it goes on just so, so, so smooth. And when you are thinning it all the way down, it gives you exactly what I want, which is I almost can't even notice that I did it. Because when you're really, really thinning down a glaze and you're going to build it up and you want to have a real big jump in color, like a lot of contrast, but a very smooth transition. That happens naturally from building it up like 20, 30 glazes. And they dry very quick. So it's not like the end of the world to do that. But that's very, very hard to do when initially from the first pass, I can see a stain. That's when you start. I feel like that's where people's um, natural draw to like things like wet blending comes from is because you can just very quickly have that transition. You can sketch it quite quick, but yeah, but it's uncontrolled. That's the problem with, with wet blending, in my opinion. Like you... you if you're working colors incrementally through glazes or if you're doing like thin uh, thin filter layers or tint layers and you're sketching colors in place in individual colors incrementally you end up with a, a typically more control of obviously where the pigment's being deposited and how you're using it um but i think specifically with the point about obviously doing those half and halves and things like that the, the paint that you're then shading with has a behavioral characteristic and chemical composi composition very similar to the colors that are on there already so combining that, the chemical side, the, 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 the pigment side and all that, the, the behavioral nature of that paint, that individual paint, because all paint has different personalities. When you combine that with... with um, I like these the, are personalities. Though. They do, yeah. they yeah. do. I, 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 paint does, paint does yeah, have... Yeah, no, that's in, a great in, description. Like, yeah. They do have in individual personalities, like even within the same branch of, 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 of paint range, like but base, base paints take Mephiston red and, and Abaddon black, Abaddon super satin and Mephiston's matte in finish. Like they, they're, they're both base paints, but they behave totally differently it's like going to someone's house at christmas and meeting a family for the first time and expecting them all to be the same you know they're not they're not going to be like the kid will be climbing up the christmas tree the dad will be watching the footy or the mum will be watching or whatever kids blah, blah. climb up the christmas tree yeah. as, you as, in, christmas. As, in, as in the personalities of the of the of the no that's football, what christmas to, day either so to, so oh for two on those well anyway yeah you got the idea all right yeah. okay but um i think that's why though like going back to my point that's why people want to wet blend because mm -hmm. i think it comes from like this bad experience of like doing glazes and realizing it stains and it's a nightmare and they don't want to thin it down to like, yeah. a crazy degree they say like oh, I can get this like really quick result that's like basically the same and it's much smoother, which I agree with in principle. Yeah, yeah. But if you want that like box art look or refi just refinement in general, like the, like the other thing as well is like when you are doing blending, like 
you should always finish a push or pull stroke within the same color of the brush or that you got on the brush. Because the thing is, if you move the brush, and let's just say you're going from you're going from black to Mephiston red, if I've got a thin translucent layer and it's Mephiston red that I've got on the brush, if I do a push stroke from the black uh, from the red that I've got on the brush into the black, well, when I lift the brush off, it's going to deposit and create a watermark. So you're saying like paint in the direction of the color that you're using. trying to go to. Yeah. So yeah. if I've got Mephiston red on the brush and I'm going from black to Mephiston red, then what I'll do is I'll start the thin layer and apply less pressure in the black area and put, do the push stroke into the Mephiston red. Mm -hmm. And then when you lift the brush off, Mephiston red is going to leave a little bit on the, on the Mephiston red area. And what's going to happen when it dries? Well, it dries Mephiston red. So there's no difference. Mm -hmm. So you're mitigating watermarks and, and things as you're moving just by choice of movement of the brush. That, that's one of the things that when you combine that, that thought process and approach to blending with, um, with uh, the color mixing that we're saying, those properties and characteristics of the paint being closer to the inherent paint that's on the model. And by doing the brush in that manner, you completely eradicate the worry of creating the brush strokes and the brush marks. Um, so yeah. Uh, the next one I've got here, which is the, the multiple stages of edge highlights. And this is the thing that blew my mind like the most a long, like a long time ago when I started this, everyone starts out and they do like an edge, they, they start practicing edge highlighting, right? Which we're all familiar with, I'm sure. And you start doing that single edge highlight. And then at some point I was like, I'm a genius. I've sussed out that they do this chunky stage highlight as we like to call it. And the thin stage highlight, which I think everyone who's delved into box art painting might possibly be familiar with if you aren't already. That seems like the next step, right? And I thought that I like sussed it out once I'd started doing that. And then when I started like being exposed to it a bit more like around here and speaking with yourself, James, or whatever, and going further down this rabbit hole, when I realized that there's actually like, in some cases, like six, seven, eight stages of edge highlights, which are like just off the bat, you might understand what that means. But that was like the biggest jump I went from like box art approximate to like actually starting to make my models look like the ones on the box. And it's basically this concept of when you're doing your edge highlights, you're building up these layers of color and you're almost doing these like blends that aren't blends because you have these such subtle jumps. Because they're so refined. In, exactly. Yeah. But basically, this is the concept that within your edge highlight, like within that stage, towards like a corner or an edge, you'll start building and blending in even lighter shades. So often on a box art model, you'll see that chunky stage that I've just spoke about and then that thinner edge stage, which I think a lot of people know. You might often see a third stage within that where the previous stage was actually just acting as sort of an almost base color to make the uh, the pigment properties of that lighter color like blend in smoother. So you know, some paints have like poorer coverage than others. This is the sort of like overlapping of it seems like the previous stage was a bit pointless because you're covering it up again, but actually it's giving you like more vibrancy. Kind of like I spoke about when um, you're using like fluo paints, you want to do them over white because they don't have, you're not reaching the full potential of the paint. Then within that, you'll start seeing, okay, on a corner, in towards the corner, like you said, James, like brushing in the direction that you want to go in, you'll start seeing, okay, in the corner, it starts getting even brighter to signify that that's like a sharp edge. And then within that, there might be an even brighter one. And then you might see these like tiny dots on the end. And when you start, we've spoken about this before on the podcast, myself especially, of when you start blowing up images like on the GW, uh, the GW website and like actually studying these models and you actually really pixel people or if you like go into Photoshop and you start doing like the eyedropper tool and looking at the colors, when you actually really study them for like a significant amount of time, you realize what that starts to mean of like eight layers of edge highlights, for example. It's not always been that way. So, so like the, the chunky and the multiple thin stages towards the light point, it, 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 they've not always done chunky. Like it's, I don't know the time frame specific, but there was a, there was a change from the traditional one edge highlight as in the, the, the edge highlight, but that along that edge highlight, you have multiple stages to the bright point or whatever. And then obviously chunky, I, the chunky kind of highlight. And it's really to show that color is radiating to that edge, if that makes sense. So you have the bank, the, the armor color, the, the first stage chunky highlight, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. And it's just so that the eye, draw, it helps the eye draw to the to the edge, if that makes sense. It shows that radiation of light or, or hitting that, that tone or color on the armor. So you're saying, so at one point, the standard box art way of doing things would have been, it's still only one edge. As in one, you edge everything, but like, along but those the, edges. But along those edges is different tones on like to the a lighter point. area or a darker area. Or yeah, I don't like know that. the time frame. Like I, like I, what, me when I first started painting and I started looking at box art images and going right, I really want to paint like that. 
obviously back then I wasn't sitting on Photoshop. I didn't have the eyedrop at all. I didn't know. So I, I from my memory and from my knowledge of as a, as a child painting and looking, getting a box of, of Games Workshop models and going, I want to paint my models like that. I want to be as good as that. I want to paint as good as that. Or I say, good, I'm not, I, I want to get there at some point in my life and I'm nowhere near there. Just want to throw that out there and caveat it. Um, but like, uh, I only ever noticed a single highlight stage as in, where the highlight was placed and along that highlight. So take a shoulder pad, you've got the brightest point here at the top and you've got that edge that runs on the trim. The color would increase in vibrancy and brightness to the lot, to that point along that edge rather than have. It's within the same dimension. Yeah. Within yeah. the same dimension. So you wouldn't have like a chunky. Rather than then, coming in from the surface to the edge. To the edge. Yeah. yeah. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have that. Whereas you know, now you've basically got it on both. Got both. You've got like no, horizontal got, and vertical. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Gradients. Yeah. Which, which, hundred percent. Like when you see it and you go, oh yeah, actually that, that really makes total sense. Cause it's it, obviously that on a 28 mil model, like, you know, you see those, you see those stages because obviously it's to force the eye and show the eye the way that that's, that's lit. Um, but in real life, you look at something when light's hitting it, you don't see all the stages of color vibrancy changing to the edge, if that makes sense, or to that bright highlight on the edge. You don't see that, but it just helps define the model and define the details really well. Um, yeah. I do you think it's an interesting thing to bring up? Oh, in real life when you look at something X, Y, Z, because like when comparing to box art, because the biggest thing I always struggled with, with being as in love with the box art style as you two are, I still, obviously it looks fantastic. Um, but the biggest thing is the, the lack of realism. And I think when we get into it, we're going to mention some of our favorite heavy metal paint jobs in, in a little bit. And when we get into my one, I'll kind of explain a little bit more about why I like it. But I think the thing I always struggled with was like when, where to pull from real world reference and where not to, when it comes to the heavy metal box art style, because obviously an, a sharp edge on absolutely everything isn't realistic. There's no strong light source there. It's to make the model look good. It's to make sure you can see every part of the model. So I always struggled with like, what bits are you pulling from? real I think it's a high life and what bits aren't you and i think that mostly comes down to the edges or just the highlighting in general no i, I, I think it's a hybrid like it, yes you, you, you're exactly right like you know everything doesn't have a glowing perfect edge but i think there's a, a really good hybrid of like of of that style to make things look amazing and show every bit of detail and also an overlay of real world onto it as well like liquid in vials like rust and, and chipping and all those kind of stuff or like you know subtle tonal variants and gradients on shoulder pads and things like that, where where the light would naturally hit and follow the volume and things like that you do you do 100 have that um but it is that hybrid of both those things it's the it's at the end of the day that paint job is what sells that model and it's what makes that model look amazing in the box that makes people like myself when i was a kid or whatever fall in love with that and go wow i want to paint like that you know um so it's doing its job but at the same time it's it's nice to see the development of it over the years from from second all the way from second edition through to where we are now where you've got that double angle of, of variance on the models you've got it's along like the more edge. of a hybrid with realism than it ever has been yeah i would I, i'd say that i mean you, we've all seen that like you know so even some of the new ultramarine models from like um from i think leviathan and have got like i've got like little bits of spattering and chipping maybe, in like, bits maybe, and maybe with them. like dark imperium or indomitus they really started to go in on the indomitus went pretty hard indomitus was yeah dark them. imperium was really clean like they were they, 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 more they, they like, were really clean oh yeah and then and then yeah, no, uh, Indomitus. Indomitus they, was the one they, that started They went the heavy way. on weathering and, and glazed volumes and stuff like that. And I, I do like to see that with the box art stuff personally because it's like, like I say, I always struggle to get fully on board with... I think this also might come down to the, the not being as nostalgic for the 90s stuff. Because mm -hmm. like looking at... like That that one is definitely... It's just like solid colours, sharp edges, like yeah. incredible work, obviously. But like yeah. it's that that style and it, it's progressing in a more realism way in air quotes, I guess. Well, that's something you just touched on was, was the glazing thing. So one of the things that I sort of touched on earlier was seeing base paints as foundations rather than this is the, either the mid, not even the mid tone, like it's, it's your starting point. Right. And what you'll see with, this is kind of one of those things that I feel like every metal kind of pick and choose between. Like if you look at, not even just within a time frame within just like any given release. Like maybe it's just due to time or just a particular style, how they're feeling. Um, 
you'll see a lot of what we spoke about with indometers of glazing shadows on flat surfaces. So basically, whenever there's a flat surface, it's rare that you would see it just as one flat color with an edge. Sometimes you see that on some of the box arts, like especially with squads and things, but especially on characters and especially of late, you will see that there is massive transitions and like huge amounts of contrast in glazing shadows down. So particularly on like a leg panel of like uh, like new Primaris style armor, you'll see towards the bottom of, for example, an Ultramarine, there's a much, much darker blue, like almost black glazed all the way down the panel. I, th I think it's added a lot to the models. I think like it's so back in the day, like in second edition, like black panel lining was like very prominent on, on, on models as in like you would literally panel line all the panels with black to show that deep shadow, that show that shadow in it. Obviously that high contrast to the brighter colors just really made all those schemes stand out massively. I think it's really good that as, as, as time has progressed and as obviously the, the style of painting for box art has adapted and evolved and in, improved. Um, and obviously quite considerably from where it was back in the day, like, um, you know those those shadows and that sort of darkening of the of the shadows has has really become way more refined and and just it really adds so much more to the models which I think is is, is great. I don't think it's just so much a shadow thing as such of it is like a visual interest. Like it won't even always it does, yeah. be this it won't always a, necessarily be to show off a shadow. It would just be to show much more visual interest. This is kind of what I'm saying again, but like a different point is that like the glazing of shadows is like a thing to make it look more realistic, but they're using it in a non-realistic way. Mm -hmm. You get what I mean? Like they're glazing shadows onto flat panels that wouldn't look like that, but it's to make the model look better. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that it's just like one of those things where it's like, it does initially, I think I'm maybe me personally need to settle on exactly what, what part of the scale between the, the box the, art you know, and the realism like that, I want, that I want though. to be on because I find it difficult to get like super, super excited about things where I'm like, but it wouldn't look like that. <laughs> it yeah. wouldn't look like it, that. Do you know what? It's a really hard task and I've got to take my hat off. Like it, it really is a hard task to do both the two sides of the coin. One, paint the models in a way that sells the model as best as physically possible, but also as an artist and as a painter where you know a volume is lit a certain way or light would interact a certain way or it wouldn't interact a certain way painting it in a way that does the core purpose of the paint job, which is to paint the model extremely well and also have it as a marketing asset, but at the same time, do it in a way which emulates the style of, of the team, but also as well, take into account, you're juggling so many different things. Oh yeah, there. it's, like, like, it's know, an like, impossible task to land on one definitive thing. Um, My point of the analysis on like the shadow stuff though was... You'll especially notice this if you speak to anyone who's like not familiar with like miniature painting is at a glance when it's done really well and it is like that kind of more realistic sort of pull, it doesn't immediately hit you that it's painted detail, which is why I say you need to like study the photos, right? Because if you look at a marine and you see that it's like darker in the shadows and it's so smooth, like it's not a visible like brush transition. At a glance, if you're not like super familiar with painting in that style, you might just think like, oh, that's the lighting of the photo. But yeah. everything on that model is intentionally put there. Yeah. yeah. And it's a crazy attention to detail. Yeah. I think one of the things that just going back around a second, I know we've got some more points to get to, but going back around to when you were saying about um, blowing the images up and really looking at them and stuff. I think I mentioned on a way older episode, like one of the original three or four episodes that we did, um, cause we'd just been to Warhammer Fest yeah. and at Warhammer Fest, they had the display for the real size of certain models. So there's like, go and measure yourself against the Terminator. Oh, do you mean oh, that right. massive oh, okay. Terminator statue that was- Not was the there. statue, it was on a it flat, on a wall. Okay. and it was just the box art images on a huge thing as life size. So it was like- gotcha. the box I don't think I saw art, that there. It was Back the wall. box art. Well, it was as you walked in, it was behind, behind you. Behind so unless right. you turned around, but the best thing about it um, was it went all the way up to show you how tall a Primark was and they used the lion and it was the box art lion image blown up. Oh, so you're looking at a nine foot you're photo. You're looking at a nine <laughs> foot photo of the box art and you could see if you really wanted to, I mean, it looked incredible it's still. still like it's amazing, insane yeah. how good it looked, that blown up. But if you could start to analyze it way easier and spot like, okay, there's a highlight there, there's a highlight there. Um, and looking at that was really eye opening to like get at to, there's only so much you can do with like zooming in on your phone and stuff. You well, know it's also I mean? like down to 
a few variables like one the quality of the image and two like the resolution exactly the so if they're, blow, if they're blowing an image up to nine feet tall or whatever then it's that they're using the highest possible quality thing and it yeah. looked fine like it looked good you could see everything um and it was really interesting to get to look at a paint a, a box art paint job that blown up you're never gonna get a screen that big that you can look at it on at home yeah so, you know it's just yeah it was, it was great really helpful as well like there was, i remember there was a one of the i think it was either a stern guard model or there was a model that was scroll on a shin and like i think it was like ones from the um from the box oh, the, a badden was on there as well though wasn't it i had a badden on badden there might have been on sure, there i can't but, remember yeah but it was either badden or gun too busy looking at the line i can't remember yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like in awe <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank god they didn't have a blood angel though because james wouldn't have come home. i'd still yeah. be there now yeah. like i'd still i'd be following the thing as they take it out he'd um, have been like yeah cutting that out <laughs> And bring it, bring it back. I do you know not, when, like, I do not carry sharp implements with me. All right. You know when you're um, at a, like a like a shopping mall or something. There's like the tannoy comes on for like some lost child. That would have been yeah. us looking for James. Yeah, yeah. he would have been like, you know, you get the people go to the cinema and like they've got a poster about this for a film from like three yeah, years yeah. ago, and they're like, you can do anything with that, and they give it to you sometimes. Yeah, yeah. It'd be like at the end of the weekend, you can do anything with that. Like, I'm like, gonna, oh. I'm gonna segue into a little story that does actually fit quite well with that. I went oh, to one gosh. of the Horus Heresy weekenders. And they came to the end of oh, it. Oh, I know this story. Yeah. And that what well, didn't even come into my yeah, head. So, and I know this. Yeah, and that's so, a, well, I've to, got a feeling I know where this is going. I went, yeah. to, I went yeah. to one of the Horus Heresy Weekenders. Um, and uh, I don't think the event staff wanted to take all the roller banners home at the end of the stuff. And they were selling them. I might have bought um, a certain Primark roller banner uh, at that event and put that home. So yeah. It was like when they had revealed the Sanguinius model. So he's got like the roller. It used to be up in the office. Yeah. Like it was like, it's the Sanguinius. Um, like it's just like, you know, like we have the yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just like for the stand where you could go and see it. James has got one of them. I weren't going to miss. Do you know anyone Jay-Z? else in the world that's like? Do you know what? It, it, you know what? it actually really helped me when I was painting my one because I just rolled that up and had a look at that one close up. Again, yeah, it's like a blown up image. Exactly, isn't it? that's exactly what it was. Yeah. That is basically the exact story that I just told. Is like, wouldn't it be ridiculous if that <laughs> happened? <laughs> Fact and I happens. knew it happened that yeah. I forgot. Yeah. But yeah. Um, that goes back to, you say like having it big blown up, like what I like to do just by default whenever I'm painting, especially if I'm painting my model to look like a box up one, if I'm like copying one, I'll get the highest res photo I can get from either the GW website or uh, somehow, sometimes Warhammer community have better photos, but yeah, screenshot on my iPad, zoom in like all the way in on like as small of a like micromanaged section at a time just to do that visually. Like, I feel like that's probably the most successful thing. Unless you want to go to a heresy weekender and buy a poster. <laughs> uh, that's probably as close as you can get. One of the things as well, like to paint like the box art is every single detail on a model, because the box art is painted to, I guess, like sell the model, like you said, Joe, and like show off every single sculpted detail on it. Sometimes it's not actually apparent what something is unless you look at that like reference. No, I remember James's big thing is like all these like lenses and whatnot that I didn't even know existed on like some of these models. Like, you know, like on the back of um back of like a jump pack, like there's like little circles on the side, which I always thought was like, oh, this like little metal thing. Apparently that's a lens. Bolters. To, to be fair, the, I, the one thing I'll say on it, because when James talks about things that he's opinionated on. Yeah, there are facts on opinionated. He can, he can be very convincing. Pa- very, very passionate about certain things. He can be things. very passionate and yeah. make it sound like a fact. Uh-huh. But... There's certain things specifically with the lenses where although I agree with James when he says it looks better if that thing's a lens, Mm -hmm. it looks better if the thing on the end of a gun is a lens. When you look at the box art, sometimes those... Sometimes they are the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, The the buttons and things on a gun, yeah, it looks better if you paint them like lenses. Mm -hmm. But when you actually look at artwork... Or just as lit up, like... Yeah, yeah. Not lenses, but I get what you mean. Not like lenses, but like a... So it looks like a button or something. So it's got got power power running. Yeah, it looks like it's got something on it. Yeah. It's the visual interest thing again. Um, It adds a visual interest, but... It's not necessarily wrong not to, because when you look at no, the no. box art, a lot it's not of the a case time, of being wrong. It's just that attitude of like, if you start skimping on the small details, everything else starts to fall apart. It's one of those things where it, it's kind of this all or nothing of like, it seems so insignificant to paint that most people wouldn't bother. But when you've got 20 insignificant things that most people don't bother to paint and you've done all of them, all of a sudden your model looks like a massive step up. I, I, think, yeah, I yeah. think the thing is though, like, and I think the reason why, again, the whole thing with like lenses and details and bits and bobs, like the artwork and it, it is, the art, some artwork has stuff painted like that, some artwork doesn't and obviously blah, blah, blah. But the whole purpose of the box art model is to sell the model and to show the model off really well. 
in the same respect of there are certain things like I always see, and I say this to anyone who speaks to anyone, I see 40K very much as like science fiction, historical modeling, which is a weird oxymoron, but I'll explain what I mean. Like the law and narrative overlays on top of the paintwork and the sculpting of the detail, sculpting the models, uh, uh, things that you can directly correlate and go, right, I'm going to take this from the law and narrative and put it onto and paint it onto the model to add that law and narrative onto the there's model. There's definitely a, a similarity in terms of, I think it's where Warhammer specifically is unique with when it comes to science fiction is that because of the not the law. background is so vast like yeah, there's yeah, yeah. so much information yeah um, that is that is there that you can almost treat it like historical modeling that's, because that's it's the like, way that I look at it there's the, almost the same amount of well there is of, yeah of, of a fictional version there's almost it's, the same amount of information it's, it's, fictional, but it's, just it's fictional, fictional history that's what it is well it's not fictional it just hasn't happened yet yes yeah, okay. it might yeah. happen yeah it might happen it's it might history I don't want in the future to be real yeah yeah, it's, yeah. yeah I don't want Tyranny to be real <laughs> uh, okay but but the thing he keeps on bringing out, that up. Of, out of everything in Warhammer you wouldn't want to be real Tyranny they will eat the whole galaxy eventually yeah I'd rather that than be like just do that and then I'm gone rather than like Oh, I'm being like tortured by Nurgle. <laughs> James has been watching, <laughs> do you know what I mean? James has been watching too much Starship Troopers, I think. The, the yeah. only thing I will say is like, going to just touching upon the, the actual box art models again, like, you know, the thing is, is that if you do start doing all those little details and bits and bobs, visually as a product that you're selling, it, it, it can almost become a bit intimidating for someone to paint it. So there has to be enough painted on the model painted extremely well that looks phenomenal to sell the model to make people pick it up and get that warm feeling of like wow these are amazing but at the same time as a painter approaching looking at it and going oh do i have to really do that 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 like i understand totally why I that's not it, done it, as it's well on, it's specifically on it's a good point actually because it's specifically more restricted on models that you would expect new people to the hobby to buy exactly so like yeah. intercessors like we're talking about the lenses aren't necessarily all done on the guns and stuff but i'm even talking about in artwork and stuff they're not always no well, glowing that's the, or whatever that's the thing yeah but um but then when you do get to a character model mm -hmm. sometimes it'll be like these insane little vials and things there'll be like a done cable like, that you didn't even know was like a cable yeah, yeah. exactly so with and it's the, not just painted it's painted and highlighted and highlighted again and highlighted again and shaded and recess shape. Yeah. So I think there is, um, there is more of that on models that they maybe don't necessarily expect people to buy first. Sure. When you look at the more infantry and stuff, they obviously hold back on certain things. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's probably I, an element as well of like, I'm sure they've got deadlines to hit and I'm sure oh, they've of course, got, yeah, of course so, yeah, yeah. So it's, I'm, I'm sure there's also an element of, yeah, in an ideal world, they would. I think that's potentially like did. obviously we don't know. No one knows unless you're there. But I think that's potentially actually the most impressive thing about the heavy metal paint jobs is that I can only imagine how short some of these deadlines are, and they end up looking like that. Mm -hmm. Like that. That's what something that probably doesn't even get mentioned, and that is that adds a whole. Uh, obviously, we deal with um, loads of different painters painting to different levels, all high levels. Yeah. But um, so we have some uh, experience with how long certain, certain level of paint job should take. And I can only imagine how, how important it is for them to be able to do that quickly, which yeah. blows my mind that someone can do something that looks like that quickly. The, the, the like, real super impressive thing for me is that they're painting obviously in advance. So you're, you're painting stuff that's not due to come out obviously for whatever time frame, whatever. But even still with the grace of that, lead time in front they're still up they're still at 11 trying to get well, it something done, that i glossed you know on I mean? in like a previous episode was like, to your point they've got no reference like they're kind of making it the model no. like was just made like there's yeah. no box art to copy there's no like i, I presume there's some con like chat with the designers and whatnot but like it's how do, when i sit and think like oh what color should this be i look at the box i look at the box art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah, it's like it's 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 that fine balance of um of of feasibility for someone picking it up, but at the same time, from a painter's perspective, painting it and doing the, the model, paint perspective, I love it when that gets yeah. up, yeah. doing doing. doing like I, it's never on purpose. Yeah, it's never on purpose. It just I always happens. just chuck it in off a cuff, and it don't mean to. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but like it's it's yeah, it's kind of like it's that fine balance of the two, making a really good marketing asset and really good box art miniature, and at the same time. 
making it enjoyable to paint for the team member in a time restricted deadline, but at the same time, adding on the bits, which make that model, the thing when you look at it for the first time, you're like, I need that model, mm. uh, you know, and I want to paint it. So, so yeah. Big news, tickets are now on sale for the Siege Studios painting classes for 2024. For over eight years, we've been running in-depth, hands-on classes across the UK, which has allowed us to create the perfect learning environment for improving your painting skills. With a variety of topics available, all our courses are taught by senior artists and feature practical demonstrations in a relaxed environment that welcomes interaction from you, discussions on theory, and an open Q&A session so you can ask that burning question you've had on your mind. You can even bring your models for feedback. To book now and reserve your place before tickets set out, head over to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop. I'll see you on a class soon. Uh, final one I've got here on my list to touch on is something that I neglected for probably far too long in my painting, and that is highlighting metallics. Oh, I hate it. I've, been, I've, I've said it on a few times on here. I just It stresses me out, highlighting metallics. Why is that? It's just that this seems like just... Um, we're talking true metallic. Sure, yeah, yeah true metallic metal, yeah. Just seems like... We've, we've spoke about the different paint consistencies and stuff like that, and it just... Doing the, there's two parts to it. Actually doing the edge highlights with metallics, I just find really difficult to mm -hmm. get the right paint consistency. But then the second thing is what I've been banging on about this entire episode is like it having a metallic puts like a more realistic light on that area because it's like going to have, it's going to, yeah. So, and then we do the glazing into the shadows still on, on metallics. But then we're also putting an edge on it, which it's not going to exactly look like that. It's like this half realism, half not thing again that I think I always struggle with. Um, Throwing realism out the window just for a second. Like the reason, I guess I never thought about it because like you've kind of got that natural like reflection, right? Because it's a reflective surface. Like it's got, it looks like metals. So you're like, why would I highlight it? That doesn't make sense. Mm. But I didn't realize the value it has on particularly on like weapon cases and things like that, whenever there's like a really sharp edge, I'm not talking so much about like when you've got like little trinkets and bits, but like say you've got a shoulder pad trim and it's, for example, gold, having a really, really sharp defined highlight edge on it makes it look like a sharp edge, if you mm. get what I mean, rather yeah. than it's like, you know, when you look at like an Apple product, like a MacBook or something, you feel like if you touch the edge, it would like cut your finger yeah, almost because yeah. it's just so precise. It gives it that like crispness. Yeah. And I neglected it for the longest time because it just like, it, it kind of seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? Like, oh, okay, paint it a metallic surface and then paint it as if it was paint. It doesn't seem to make sense. Mm -hmm. But like, regardless of your opinions like that, in terms of trying to make your model look like the box, like there are much in a similar way that there are with the other edge highlights, like metallics are treated very much in the same way by the heavy metal team. Maybe not so much in the sense of like a chunky and a thin, but kind of like James said, where you've got this like just one horizontal plane like, edge and there'll be brighter corners picked out. That's something that, again, I didn't really realize from studying so much because it looks like it should look when it's done right in the sense of when a photo is taken of a model and you see that the bolt casing has this like sharp edge on it, you just think that that's like the lighting or yeah. that's just what it would look like anyway because you kind of do have this natural edge-ish highlight when you've got a really nice uh, metallic paint that's got like a, it, it looks like metal, so like yeah. just light plays with it. I think that's probably the thing where it's like, if you don't do it perfectly, you end up looking at it and just going, I should have just left it. <laughs> should have just left it base coated because it's yeah. going to reflect everything anyway kind of thing. So I, I, I love I love metallics. I've got a little bit of experience painting metallics on, with certain golden armoured warriors. Um, yeah. I absolutely love painting true metallic metal. Um, and I've, Loved it for a long, long time because, uh, and I'm not, I'm nowhere near the best, but I, I'd like to think from the multiple models I painted with it, I've got a little bit of experience in in knowing to kind of like where to shade and what tones and things. But I do still, still do think the best thing for painting true metallics and making them look good is literally looking at go on Google Images and just search like gold ring or copper pipe or like silver lamppost or whatever blah blah just find stuff that's that's a real image of metal refracting light and look at the shapes and then paint on your model where the bright points are uh, leave the pot, paint it bright and then start shading the bits that shadow would naturally hit on those shapes like the sphere the cylinder the cube or whatever blah blah um i mean obviously if you're trying to like emulate like the box art look the best place i would say to start probably would be the box art the box art yeah, model yeah, right yeah 
But I understand what you're saying. In you can like how to basically yeah, yeah. how to naturally light and paint the bright mids and darks and shadows, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, on on metallic objects would be would be to do that. You're quite right. Obviously, box art's a really good way of doing it. One of the things I would say as well. Number one, some people don't, especially if they're new, don't necessarily always realise some areas of the box are a non-metallic metal, and sometimes sure. it's true metallics. Yeah. Um, I'd say non-metallic is. It's rarer. Pretty rare. It's way rarer. My, but it my, does mod, my model, what we were speaking about this earlier, but my model for in a minute or in a bit, my model has got a section on it which you look at it and you just think it's metallic. It's so well done. Mm. And I think there is actually a case for, I can't remember if this is definitely on the box art or not, but the, is it the like Lucidian Star, Star Striders or something, the Kill Team? Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure they have both NMM There's and a few models that metallics. have both. I think as well, some of the Primaris librarians have that bit on their sword painted the in like NMM. Yeah, the filigree. Yeah. I'm pretty it's sure even a, the Leviathan um, he did, I think. Terminator Ch- uh, librarian uh, has on the axe NMM, but the rest of the model is TMM. Yeah. The, th- the thing that you've got to balance, I mean, it's difficult. I mean, because obviously you paint the metallic on the model, you paint areas of the model metallic. So you look at that and go, well, that's metallic. And then if you you know what NMM is and you look at it and you see it on the model, they kind of conflict because it's like, well, they're the same material, but they're painted very differently, if that makes sense. I think the, the way to really make it work if you're going to do it is to glaze the metallics, the true metallics, so that they look the same way that the non-metallic metal parts blend. So in that way, at least there's parity between the, the visual finish on both, if that makes sense. If you just don't bother, if you just put metallic on, pin shade it, wash it, and then just put a quick edge on it, and don't do any kind of tonal variance or like lighting it or whatever, blah, blah. And then you do properly blended NMM with like crisp highlights and dot highlight and all that kind of stuff. They kind of conflict and they're sending different messages to the, the person perceiving it. I don't um, personally love doing both. Like, I think you I would, stick, I would stick much with rather one. do one or another, yeah, like stick. being honest. It's a bit of a fringe case when there's both. There's very, very few models that I can think of in the thousands of yeah. heavy metal jobs that do that. And there's very, very few NMM jobs kicking around other than anyway, like maybe yeah. Dante. I think but. what I was getting at was, so the I think the metallics on the box art in general, if you get rid, ignore the NMM stuff for now, metallics in general, I think there's a bigger scope of difference on how they're done between each model yep. than any other thing. Like most of the power armor is painted the same. We've spoke about, they go through phases of, are oh, they glazed it more this time yeah. or whatever. It's basically plus or minus glazing, but they've done the same. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas like the metallics can look wildly different from one model to another. Yeah. Um, so I think sometimes it might be a bit like, you might have to do some digging to yeah, find yeah. the one that you actually want to copy or, yeah. If you, even if it, you don't, you might not necessarily want to do it the the style that it's done on the box art of the model that you're painting. But there might be another box art model that has a style of metallics that you're like, oh, that's kind of more what I want to do. I, th- I think, it, like specifically on the Elysians, like the, what you talk about, I think the way you kind of can bend the rule of either not going sticking to one path. I think, that, like for example, so if you have got metallic guns, you paint them obviously metallics. You do all the metallic side of stuff. But I think on their tunics, the filigree or the edge is supposed to represent like golden weave if that makes sense like a golden right. like uh, woven like that's the bit that's NMM yeah so I think doing it for that because that's like it's a different material it's not actually metallic it's like a golden thread or something like so I think that kind of kind of it works obviously because it's it's not metal that it's, makes sense I didn't yeah. really think of it like that before yeah that's yeah. the way that I look at it it's like right well uh, obviously the bit on the librarian uh, power axe is a bit different I suppose but like but um, but that's kind of the, where I think the rule would work quite well because you can still do metallics and everything, but then like if you want to make the, the, the on an officer's jacket, like the, 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 the whatever, the, you know, part of it that's detailed metallic weave, you could then do it that way and it would look still golden, but not metal, if that makes sense. Yeah, I understand what you mean. Yeah, yeah. so let's just round up this list then. So just, just to touch on all those points quickly and just do a little round up. Um, so we had the color mix in your base coats. So starting off with like a 50-50 mix, for example, of your shade and your uh, your highlight for your base mix or your foundation color, if you will. I was going to say, yeah, within that point, the big thing to take is that the, the notion of a foundation color exactly. not being your final color kind of thing. Yep. Uh, we've had the multiple stage of edge highlights. So not just your chunky and your thin, but going across that plane as well, like talking about right polays up all the way up to the corners. Uh, highlighting metallics, which we just talked about. Uh, make sure you're doing that. Uh, glazing gradients on flat surfaces just for more visual interest. And uh, painting all of the little details, like little cables and lenses and any little greeblies and bits and bobs on there. 
Yeah. Cool. Should we talk about, uh, I think we all just wanted to quickly fire off like one of our favorite sort of heavy metal paint jobs mm. and uh, just talk about why we like it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, James, do you want to kick off so that we can interrupt you when you inevitably go on for far too long? Yeah. Um, so other than the second ed box art, um, my favorite, one of my favorite models ever produced by Games Workshop is the, uh, the Captain Tycho model. One of my favourite models. Obviously, it's a Blood Angel. Sorry for anyone who's sick of me talking about them. But shocked. But um, I'll, I'll vouch for you here is that we we went through a couple of different ones, and originally you wasn't going to pick a Blood yeah, Angel. Yeah, I wasn't going to. But for reason but, uh, we couldn't we couldn't like find enough pictures of it or whatever. So. Yeah. So mine is uh, is the original Captain Tycho model. It's probably one of my one of my favourite sculpts. One of my favourite models. Um, the way that the model came about through a game, and then they created the model. I think it's just a really cool cool story for the actual model. Um, but the secondary iteration of the paint job that Joe, who used to be on the heavy metal team, who's now on the design team, painted, um, I think it's one of my favorite Games Workshop non-metallic metal uh, paint jobs ever. Like, And the, the the attention on that model, given how big that model actually is, and it's, it's actually a really, compared to obviously all the Primaris models now, it is tiny. So some of the transitions and some of the blends and some of the, the little details on that model that Joe actually painted are literally incredible. Like, obviously, you, there's been lots of really cool NMM paint jobs by Daz, by quite a few different people on the Evermetal team, Aiden on the Gulliman, et cetera, blah, blah. This is my favorite. This jumps out to me immediately as being much less stylized and much more realism. Yeah. Look NMM. At, look at the chest, the bloom on the chest. Like, yeah. you know. Because that looks to me like that could just be like the reflection of a light above the model that was taking the photo, which yeah. I guess is like the point. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I love and on the uh, gun? The, uh, we were talking about doing like the little lenses and stuff like that. And the, there's like two little blue kind of buttons, buttons on yeah. the gun. And then the light from that reflecting onto the Just sort of a bit of glow. It's yeah. just so subtle. Look in the perfect. backpack. So behind his head, there's like some little cables and lights. All the and little lights and, and stuff yeah, in there, like, And that's yeah. on one of the OG backpacks. That detail in there is absolutely minute. Like those backpacks are tiny. I, I struggle to do that even with on like the Primaris models. They've got those like little cables and buttons sort of yeah, on I the I can't insert. even make the details out by the yeah. time I've like primed it and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, this, this, this is like for me, this is probably my favorite heavy metal paint job ever. I mean, um, fair play. Starting off with a winner there. Joe, what's, uh, what's your pick here? Uh, I've gone more modern. Yep. I've gone more modern and uh, there were... But I love it, this one. Look, I'll be honest. I forgot so, how good this looks. It so, is yeah. such a good model. So I, number one, I wanted to pick something that was a bit of a, like a, not an underdog, but maybe one that doesn't immediately come to mind. Um, all I remember when the, when the, it's the, it's the new Dark Strider, Tao character. Tao. And, Tao. Tao. Um, and all I remember when this, I haven't, taken this much notice of oh my god look at the paint job from a model reveal since this like the, I, it just stuck out to me so much um and i think there's a couple of things you can go on about like the tiny detail if you look at the lens over his eye it's like this crosshatch the crosshatch pattern on that lens is absolutely insane uh it's so tiny um, I remember James painted our one of this and he was trying to replicate that and was going on about how unbelievably difficult that the must The craziest have been. part of that to me is not that they've painted a cross-hatched pattern on it. It's that the grid is like six by six. It's yeah. not like it's not tiny. two lines. Yeah, yeah. it is. Um, that, when I, I'm sort of jumping, but that, when I painted it and I saw this, I saw the, obviously saw the, you see the box art first and I was like, oh wow, that was awesome. That detail is amazing. The, 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 the almost like Vegeta Dragon Ball Z, like power reader <laughs> thing, whatever it is. Like it. Tower models are small as well. Like, yeah. like, they're already it small. Is, it is tiny and he's in a haunched like, pose as well. So like it is tiny, the model. So I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to definitely have to try and get any, as close as I can to that. And then I saw it, I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, yeah, there's, um, I think this for me, we've we've spoken about previously on uh we were talking about Grim Dark painting and how it doesn't Grim Dark painting style doesn't have to be, oh, it's caked in weathering powder, oh it's caked in oil washes or whatever, it's just got dirt all over it. To me, this is a grim dark looking paint job because it's a more realistic kind of subdued like even just when you were flipping between those images then you went from that 
Tyco model to this, it just looks so much like more subtle and dark. Yeah. Because it just, it, the spectrum that I was talking about between the heavy metal style, if you're cranking that up to only being heavy metal and it's everything's a flat panel and it's edged to realism, for whatever reason, this one for me just fits perfectly wherever I would want that to land on the spectrum. Like it's not super vibrant edges. It's really subtle. Um, there's some more little hints towards like a realistic feel in there. And then on top of that, it's the technical ability of the things like the crosshatch and how sharp some of those highlights are. I, I um, love the, the overall color scheme, the desaturated red, the yellow and the blue. It's, it's like all the just really, yeah. yeah, it's like darker yeah. and desaturated, which is why, I mean, the, the blue of the skin stands out so much. It looks so good because it's surrounded by all these like really dull colors. Um, yeah, I just love it. I think I, that was a, a, a that is one where I'm like, I think that hits the the bit on the spectrum that I would want it to hit. It's it's very good, very good. Uh, okay, finally to round out, my pick is uh is the opposite end of the spectrum rather than the tiny model. Uh, mine's a massive one. Uh, Keeper of Secrets. This for me, not only because the model is like mental, it's like one of my favorite GW models of all time, but. There's so much texture on this model. And I think the the biggest thing for me in terms of like technique that blew me away is this like, the sort of like tights on the leg. They're painted in such a way that it's like still the like really refined, sharp, heavy metal style that you expect. But it like reads as sheer fabric. If you, you, can, I mean. you can yeah, tell yeah. it's a fabric over something else. Yeah, like you can see where the skin is like prominent and touching it most. And it's like the fabric is taut you can see more skin through it, if you get what I mean. Yeah, there's a there's a Luminef model that has like a veil over, over the face. The face. Yeah. That's the same kind of same thing. And I'm thing. like, absolutely insane. But this goes back to what you said about the like treading realism with the style yeah. thing. Um, and also like the cloth textures on the back are just like classic, like super sharp heavy metal style. And the skin is also like I was going to say, that's my favorite. One of my favorite things about this model is the skin. I think the skin is absolutely phenomenal. I I the desaturated really pale pallid kind of tones uh, and coldness it makes the coldness of that skin in my mind makes the model look more more menacing i absolutely love it like mm. absolutely it's love so it. hard as well to do that in a way that looks pale but still has room to highlight it mm. but it doesn't have this like it's one of the more softer transitions like it's not this like crazy like harsh defined edge mm. like i'd say the jump between the darker shadow and the mid-tone is quite subtle and the Jump in the highlights again is like equally quite subtle, but even just the things like around the neck, like the purple tones in the shadows, like to bring out like all the sort of musculature and yeah. I'm not sure what you call that, like in in the neck, it, it's wild, wild piece. If you're a fan of the podcast and want to support the show, then what better way than with our exclusive Siege Studios merchandise? We have a bunch of high quality apparel available, as well as an assortment of painting accessories and equipment to help you while you paint. Head to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop to order now. Question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you would like us to answer on the show, please leave it in the comments on YouTube. Or if you're one of the audio listeners on Spotify, Apple, any of those platforms, uh, you can reply to our story, which we like to do once a week on Instagram at Siege Studios. Question this week is from White Gold Miniatures, who says, do you guys ever suffer from painter's block? And if so, how do you overcome it? All the time, <laughs> all the time. I think um, I think this is like way more common in smaller doses than people think. I think you think of like painter's block as being this like catastrophic, like I can't pick up a model, but I think everyone has this in like micro amounts, like to some yeah. degree. I, I think uh, look, not like regularly, every, not everyone <laughs> is probably going to agree with this or want to, I mean, not as much as they didn't agree with George's base room thing, but no, they're not going to agree with this as much or, or at least want to acknowledge this but i think the answer is that you just have to let it let it do its thing no, and, I agree. and it'll I actually come back agree with you. if you're not doing it for work if this isn't your job um and you are having to push through because it's your job if you're doing this for fun and for a hobby or even for a competition or whatever you're gonna just have to wait it out because you'll get the bug again and you'll do your best painting when you're motivated. If you're sitting there forcing yourself to do it, you're not going to be happy and you're not going to be producing very good work. So. Even when I don't have like 
a block per se when I do take a break, like unintentionally because like life gets in the way or if I go away for a few days or on holiday, what have you, when I come back, I realize not necessarily that I was feeling it, but like you feel, we've spoken about it before, like you feel so much more refreshed and more hyped for it. Mm. And I kind of feel that like, it's not the end of the world, like taking a few weeks, even a couple of months off. Like at the end of the day, it feels like you said, like your hobby, like it's supposed to bring you value. You should, it shouldn't feel like you're doing it because you have to. Honestly, like, when I realise that, not just about painting, but about anything that I felt like I should be doing. Oh, I should be playing guitar more. Oh, I should be do- I shouldn't be playing PlayStation because I should be doing painting instead or whatever. Um, and I started to just realise, oh, actually, no, I, sh- I should only be doing those things that I do for fun if I want to and it's going to benefit me. So if you're, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, recommend pushing through unless again it does change when it if it's your job and you you're trying to get that through but um but yeah i think being a bit more forgiving of yourself maybe probably the the best answer probably not the answer anyone wants i don't know how to solve it i think it's the right it just answer sort of solves itself. i think it's the right answer it's not and it not only just it solves itself but like it's okay like to not be painting like i don't, don't see it as like the end of the world it's like oh my god i've got this painting block like what am i going to do it's like don't do anything yeah if you're not enjoying painting, don't paint. Yeah. Netflix. This will always be there on. for you. Yeah. There's loads of stuff to Everyone do. Everyone also takes like, people take like year long gaps. Like yeah. it's always going to be there for you to pick back up. It's not something that like expires. Do you know what I mean? Like a few of your paints might dry out, but yeah. your models aren't going to, you know, explode. It's not like this thing that you're giving up if you're not painting for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Yeah. Trust me, when you make yourself so busy that finding time to paint is hard, you will be chomping at the bit to get back on the brushes because you hear that what you need to do is loads of chores and yeah. make yourself miserable. <laughs> do loads of boring stuff so that when you think that painting is going to be boring, it doesn't seem as boring. You thought painting was bad? Have you tried yeah. doing the washing up? Have you tried doing stuff? Yeah. Ugh. I, I, I genuinely mean just make yourself busy with other things and like completely attention and focused, distract yourself from painting to not think about it. Like um, obviously like I do a lot of, stuff for siege and for work that's not painting um and i am hungrier than ever to paint all the time because i just i'm surrounded by it i talk about it all day like we i I, see it every day i felt that from going from commission painting full time to painting like in the evenings yeah that's been the same thing for me i i i am literally like yeah like that's why i fight so hard when we get models i'm like i am painting that model because (laughs) because i'm like i'm like the, the captain being one of them i was like literally like no, I am I, because I'm like I want to paint, I, I, and that, I think that's the thing. Like, if you're midway through a project and you get it, then I like fresh eyes is also really important. Like, leave it a day. Like that helps massively. Like, if you're if you're really stuck on a project, then and you but you still have an inkling to paint, then maybe just pick a non a model so dissimilar from what you're doing that also helps. But if you're if you're no matter what you pick up, it's something that you're. I don't want to do this. Oh, I really can't put, I don't want to put the time in or put the effort in or whatever. Then, then as, as I said, like just take a complete U-turn on it and step away from painting for a period of time. I know you said about a year. I would say a year's a bit I'm long. obviously no, being no, no, I know that. I know that, yeah. but I know that, but I'm no, just but saying I think like, it's the point of like, again, for people that view it as a hobby, it's not weird for someone to fall out of a hobby for a year. No, totally. And then get no, back no, into I get it. That. Like, yeah. In the grand scheme of things as well, like five years time, you won't think of that like one year as being like a big deal. Exactly. No, yeah. yeah. yeah and and uh, to James's point, I think, you know, fresh eyes, leaving it a day, whatever. If you, if you're forcing yourself to paint something and you, and you realize, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not really up for this right now. <laughs> yeah. You will 100% thank yourself for putting it down and not just, going through it and, and pushing through it. Um, Trust me, painting. But paint. I think it, it also, it cycles back around to the motivation stuff we've spoken about a lot. I think ways to get inspired about um, uh, painting and, and just, you know, listening to stuff like this or listening to painting phase or watching YouTube channels. Like that gets me into, or seeing certain models, like we get certain models through here and I, it, that gets me You could also like paint. dip into everyone says like this hobby is sort of three hobbies, the the painting, the law and the gaming. Yeah. You could segue into just, if you're going to feel guilty about like packing it in, mm. you could segue into one of those other things. So like yeah. you could get, maybe your hobby now for the next couple of weeks could be my hobby is reading a book. Yeah. Like yeah. one of the heresy novels. Well, like, and, yeah. and by the way, either of those other things, maybe law 
you know, reading and books and stuff more than the other, uh, more than gaming. But either of those other things have an avenue to improve your painting mm -hmm. long term. So if you learn more lore, you get more attached to certain characters and things. That's going to benefit your painting because you're going to want to paint those characters. You want to come back. When to I listen, if to you get really into gaming, you're going to want to get back to painting because you want to get yourself ready great for your game. On the table, yeah. The reason I started my Sons of Horus army was because I was listening to the Horus Heresy novels, and I had previously like no interest in basically any other fa like Space Marine chapter other than uh, Blood Angels, mm -hmm. and I was also like super not into the idea of like Chaos Marines or like Trait Marines, or whatever. I listened to those books, and it like. You learn about inspired them, yeah. me. It's funny. Like I, I've spoke previously about how I've always struggled to like fall in love with one of the factions or one of the stories or whatever. Obviously, I haven't read them all. I'm sure there's one out there that I would hear and be like, "Oh, that's amazing." Um, but I was watching the Lawmasters thing and watched the Abaddon one, and I was like, "Oh, that is cool, actually, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Like that's like have Black Legion stuff the is first, cool." Have you listened to the first few um, horror story novels? I, I think I did. Um, which is almost like a, a rite of passage. I think I did the first like hour and said, oh, yeah, right. I'm going to do it. Oh, right. <laughs> and then just did do Because those first four books are basically like an enclosed story mm. and it follows the Sons of Horus and Abaddon think, is a key I'll, I'll be honest, I tried, I, I do like an audio book and I, I, I can follow them quite well, but I tried quite early on in getting into Warhammer again or at least seriously getting into Warhammer and I found it very difficult to follow who was who and these names that I wasn't familiar with and you know, what was, what was going on. So maybe, maybe I'll go back to it. But um, yeah, that was one of the things I struggled with. Um, Cause I really early on tried picking up one of the books and I couldn't really wrap my head around it. Cause like there was just so much expected like baseline level of knowledge that I didn't have. And then revisiting those books, um, I think it was last year, like with much more knowledge, it was just, yeah. a lot more um, digestible, I guess. Yeah, I think for me as well, between like Lawmasters and, and other stuff, I think the um, uh, looting, yeah. looting stuff has looting done great. more m the most for me with appreciating the law and different little stories and things. Um, yeah. Yeah, so there you go. There's a quite a lot, big answer about that. Yeah. Uh, hobby hacks. This is our closing little tradition uh, where we share a hobby hack with you. Hopefully you can uh, implement into your hobby. Uh, mine is we've spoken to death right about the homemade wet palette thing which i'm not going to get into right because it's hobby hacks right i would just say and caveat that if you are someone who is using a wet palette like a pre-manufactured one like yeah, yeah. any one of them you know the ones ditch the paper it come with or the packs of paper that you buy and just get a roll of baking paper from the supermarket cut up to the same size it will work wonders for you. The paper is much more absorbent. It's much easier to work with. It's a nice slick surface. It will make big gains for you without having to go down this whole avenue of buying Tupperware. I'm going to go one step further. Uh -huh. The thing that I use, and I haven't had to restock it for a long time, I got like a, a um, multi-pack thing of pre-cut sheets of that, of um, baking paper. Not It wasn't for... Uh, wet palettes I think they're like A3 um, sheets right um, off of Amazon and when I cut them in half they're pretty much the perfect size for my Tupperware right. um, that I, I, for whatever reason the fact I think maybe that they're stored just flat already they're not rolled up I've just had better lift but yeah I've had yeah. better, better luck see when I pre-cut mine from the baking paper I you put, don't just flatten I them put, all out. I flatten them all out and I put them in like a plastic sleeve. Funny enough, I put them in the sleeve that the original pallet paper came in <laughs> and I store them in there. And because they're like sat flat and I cut like a whole roll at a time. So it lasts me like six months. Yeah. Like, so you're kind of the same thing. It's, yeah. It, yeah. The, them rolling up isn't really a factor anymore. Yeah. I think, yeah, I never really did that. But then I got the, I haven't, I haven't had to buy any for ages. It was like a massive, it was like a tenner. Yeah. It was like a massive amount of uh, sheets of yeah. paper. There you so, go. Yeah. Well, my thoughts on to, on on wet they're, they're very well documented. I won't even let James but, answer. But all, all, I will add on one thing, which is is that all that matters TK is that Max or something. No, I'm not. Stip, I'm not spouting any of that today. All I'm going to literally just say is that all that matters is that the paint behaves in a way on that palette that you can that you can quantify. I said because there are certain behavioural characteristics on baking sheet which no other paper that I've used 
uh, or tried, be it a preordained manufactured one or be it a, a, another type of wet palette paper or whatever, um, they don't, nothing ever behaves the way that it does on, on that baking sheet because of the way that it, it is. Um, so I think you, you should definitely try it, see how the paint behaves on there and then and then go make a decision, basically. I think because I used like a pre-manufactured one that comes with all the sheets, I thought like, why on earth would I bother using baking paper? Yeah, Like yeah. I've already got all this paper. But like well, it behaves so differently. Of course it does, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of Paint Perspective. Uh, if you could do us a favor, if you're listening on any audio platforms, please leave us a rating or a review. That would really, really help us out and help the podcast grow. And if you're watching on YouTube, please feel free to leave a comment below and importantly, subscribe so that you can catch all of our future episodes. And please leave a like as well. Help us with the YouTube algorithm gods and we can keep on bringing these episodes for free every single week. We will catch you next time. <laughs>